So a full six years after the second film in the series, Hammer Films released their third Frankenstein movie titled The Evil of Frankenstein in 1964. But despite the title, the film features a Dr. Frankenstein who gets helplessly railroaded by everyone around him and a Frankenstein monster whose only defining trait is being possibly the lamest Frankenstein monster of all time. Let's talk about it. Hey, what's going on my friends? Welcome again to the Cobwebs channel. My name is Daniel and this is the third video in this series that I'm doing on the Hammer Frankenstein movies. Now to truly understand what the heck happened with the evil of Frankenstein, I've got to give you a little background. Now when I talked about the first two movies in this series, I said that one of the reasons those films are so good is they were completely separate from Universal. So they didn't have the rights to anything about Frankenstein that was created by the Universal Monsters films. They could only use the book as a reference. And this meant that those movies ended up being extremely unique. Nothing like the Universal Frankenstein films, wholly their own thing, and they're just all the better for it. Well, for this third film, they finally got to partner with Universal. That legendary studio actually co-produced this film, which meant finally they had the rights to everything Universal Monsters Frankenstein. No longer did they have to be original. No longer did they have to go their own way. Isn't that great? Great. While Terrence Fisher directed every other Hammer Frankenstein movie starring Peter Cushing, this is the only one he didn't. Because of scheduling conflicts, he couldn't do it, and Freddie Francis was brought in to direct. Now, Freddie Francis was not, and really is not, primarily a director. He is primarily a cinematographer, an incredibly prolific and respected cinematographer. His greatest claim to fame in the horror genre on a mainstream level is probably that he shot The Innocence. He was a cinematographer for that classic ghost film. He shot David Lynch movies like The Elephant Man and Dune. No, 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 not that Dune, that Dune. He won an Academy Award for shooting the Denzel Washington film Glory. He is a renowned cinematographer, but also a director of a lot of horror movies. This was his first one, but he actually wasn't really a fan of the horror genre. And I think that comes across in this movie. Makes the film actually look more like an adventure movie than a horror movie. Really nothing about the atmosphere or the look looks particularly gothic or horror-like. Now, I should mention that Freddie Francis will go on later in his career to be a horror director that I love. He directed my favorite Hammer Dracula sequel, Dracula's Risen from the Grave. He directed a lot of stuff for Amicus, including Tales from the Crypt, one of my favorites of their anthologies. Now, the second film, The Revenge of Frankenstein, ends things in such an interesting way, with Dr. Frankenstein and his assistant Hans on the run under a new identity doing new experiments with Dr. Frankenstein's brain transplanted into a a body he created himself. He was able to use himself as part of the experiment. Now, this film opens up with Dr. Frankenstein and an assistant Hans that are on the run, that are doing an experiment that gets stopped by the local ignorant peasants who don't understand the kind of genius that Dr. Frankenstein is. So you have to wonder, well, is this continuing the continuity? Is this Hans, though played by a different actor, the same Hans? No, no, definitely not. This film is actually a total reboot. And we figure that out in a scene where Dr. Frankenstein explains his backstory to his assistant Hans. Now this tells us that this is not the Hans of the last movie because that guy knew everything about Dr. Frankenstein. And as Dr. Frankenstein gives this backstory, we see it's totally different. This is not a flashback to The Curse of Frankenstein. This is a recreation of the Universal Monsters films with Peter Cushing in the lead. Actually, with Peter Cushing as the only guy because he's all alone in this backstory. I hate this backstory section. It brings the pacing of this movie to a grinding halt. It's really boring. While the events of creating the monster, bringing him to life, are riveting in The Curse of Frankenstein, here they just couldn't be more dull. Dr. Frankenstein is all by himself. There's no one for him to talk to, interact with. There's no one to object to his experiments to create a little bit of conflict. And it just goes on forever. He finally gets the monster revived and then he's caring for the monster for a while. Again, just the two of them. It really is lame and it does solidify this as a total reboot. And we figure out that this is really an homage to the classic Universal Frankenstein movies. And I just think this is such a mistake. I think it's the kiss of death of this movie. I love the Hammer Frankenstein movie movies, when they're going their own way, charting their own path. I love to see Peter Cushing's Dr. Frankenstein advancing in his experiments and going where no one has gone before. And in this movie, he's just retracing where Colin Clive had gone before. But you say, okay, Daniel, calm down. You still get Peter Cushing as Dr. Frankenstein. Isn't that enough? 
Well, we do get Peter Cushing, and he does try his best, but I feel like this movie just really assassinates his character. He's very different, much weaker, and much dumber. See, there's a pretty great scene in this movie, actually, when Dr. Frankenstein and Hans go into Dr. Frankenstein's hometown, and they get to visit a carnival that's going on there. I love movie scenes at carnivals so much. But it's here that Dr. Frankenstein realizes that in his absence, while he's been away from home, the Burgermeister and his goons have raided his house, stole his stuff, taken his house, and rather than being cunning and intelligent, to get what he wants, like the Dr. Frankenstein of the first two films would be. He just kind of throws a fit in the middle of a crowd when he is trying so hard to avoid getting caught, to avoid anyone recognizing him. He's just like, hey, that's my stuff. Give my stuff back, you jerks. I want my stuff. This feels so out of character for him. The Dr. Frankenstein of the first two films would drop anything to go on the run and continue his experiments. And here he's just like, I want my coat back. I want my bed back. And it doesn't make any sense. I've got more problems with his character, but before we get into that, we do have to introduce the monster, the Frankenstein monster. Now they can make him look like Boris Karloff. Isn't that exciting? The monster is played by a very large and imposing man named Kiwi Kingston. And when you get to see him in his universal classic monster makeup, he, oh my gosh, what is that? He looks like his face is made out of paper mache. He looks like somebody put a cardboard box on his head and sloppily painted it. This is one one of the biggest problems with the movie. I just cannot believe that a whole film crew looked at this and said, this is done. This is camera ready. We can film this and put it in an actual movie starring great actor Peter Cushing and then put it in theaters. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. I hate this look. I hate this makeup. I think it looks so terrible, but it could be excusable if the monster was at least an interesting character. But instead, he is by far far the least interesting subject of Dr. Frankenstein's experiments in the whole series. There is no character there. Poor Kiwi Kingston, he had no previous acting experience. He wasn't an actor. So, you know, I guess he tried his best, but they didn't even give him any dialogue. He is just a lumbering menace, I guess. I can't even quite call him imposing or scary. It just feels like a guy kind of wandering around. One of the reasons that he's not a character is because he's actually truly a puppet, controlled by a puppet master who's actually not Dr. Frankenstein. You see, there's another character in this movie we haven't talked about yet, and that is Zoltan, who is a hypnotist at this carnival, played by Peter Woodthorpe. Dr. Frankenstein, before he can truly revive his creature, he realizes the brain needs a spark. It needs a little kickstart. And being the man of science that he is, he decides hypnotism is probably a great idea. So he hires the local hypnotist to get the Frankenstein monster up and running. And Zoltan does that, but he also hypnotizes the monster to only do his will. And the monster becomes the vehicle through which Zoltan will get revenge against various people in the town. Now, on one hand, Zoltan is probably the most entertaining character in this movie, but also this movie is called The Evil of Frankenstein. The reality of this movie is it's more the evil of Zoltan. And he makes Dr. Frankenstein looks stupid. Dr. Frankenstein in this movie comes across as kind of a pushover. He just kind of lets Zoltan knock him around and do whatever he wants. And Zoltan just takes away from Dr. Frankenstein, who's one of my favorite characters of all time, as played by Peter Cushing. And here, Cushing's just not really there. He just feels kind of weak and kind of lame. His character also has problems because the movie's just not well written. It's not written by Jimmy Sangster like the first two. It is written by Anthony Hines. And the movie's just lacking the clever lines. It's lacking the snappy, interesting dialogue that the first two do. So let's go ahead and rate The Evil of Frankenstein. Now for atmosphere, I'm going to give it a four. I'm always gonna like looking at a Hammer movie. They always look good at least. But this movie just doesn't look like a horror movie. It looks a little bit more adventure-like, which doesn't fit it. It's lacking that kind of spooky gothic atmosphere. I will say my appreciation for how this movie looks did rise significantly when I got the Scream Factory Blu-ray that came out a couple of years ago. The movie does, on a picture quality level, look great on this Blu-ray, because the only place I'd seen it before is this DVD set, and most of the movies on this DVD set look pretty good on DVD, even though I've upgraded most of them to Blu-ray by now. Evil Frankenstein looked abysmal. So the Blu-ray, I admit, 
did a lot for this movie. For characters, I'm gonna give this a four. It's always good when we've got Peter Cushing as Dr. Frankenstein at all, but this is probably my least favorite version of him. Zoltan is the most interesting character, but I have problems with his presence in this movie at all. But let's answer the question at hand. Is this the worst Frankenstein monster of all time? I, I don't know. I mean, there's competition. Like I think of the Frankenstein monster in Van Helsing, who I is actually a character that I like, and he's actually much closer to the books to Frankenstein monster than like Boris Karloff is. But I do hate that design. I also think of Aaron Eckhart in I, Frankenstein. I hate that version, but also they're barely trying to make him actually a Frankenstein monster in that. I gotta say, I'm hard pressed to think of a Frankenstein monster in like a real movie, not like some Z grade, zero budget kind of a thing that I like less than this. And none of the other characters register at all. The only female character in this movie is a mute and doesn't even talk. For story, a three. I am not interested in the story of this movie at all. I do not care about Zoltan's revenge scheme. I I don't care about his hypnotizing junk. I don't care about Dr. Frankenstein getting his stuff back. And for scares, this gets a one. This has nothing. This has nothing that I want out of a horror movie. The monster sucks. Uh, I can't even think of like a good kill scene. The only kill scene I can even remember off the top of my head is the monster just kind of whacking a guy up against a wall. And it doesn't even look like he's actually hitting the wall. It's not a good effect. Overall, I'm going to be generous and give this a four, but I really just don't like this movie. It's very disappointing to me. All right, that's my downer of a video on the evil of Frankenstein, but make sure you hit subscribe if you haven't, because I will be talking about Frankenstein created woman before too long, and that's going to be a lot better vibes. But for now, check out this playlist right over here for my other vintage horror reviews and give a like if you enjoy this. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. With all that said, don't forget to enjoy yourself today, have some fun, and I'll see you next time.